Christianity, the largest religion of the Western world, and China, the oldest nation of the East, have interacted many times through history, as they still do today. However, as you will see, the coexistence has often been tumultuous with many unexpected events. The story of Christianity in China begins with silk. The Roman Empire imported silk from China since about the 1st century AD. However, the rise of the Persian Sasanian Empire in the 3rd and 4th century, which was at war with Rome, broke the Silk Road and therefore considerably slowed down importation to the Roman Empire. In the 6th century, Emperor Justinian I of the Byzantine Empire decided to look for a solution. It was there that two monks of the Nestorian Church got their idea to make a fortune. The Nestorian Church, or Church of the East, follows the vision of Nestorius, Archbishop of Constantinople, who believed that Jesus was not truly God, but only partly divine and partly human. The two Nestorian monks were preaching Christianity in India. In 551 AD, they travelled to China and studied the process of silk making. It was probably there and then that Christianity ever entered the Chinese territory. The next year, the monks approached Justinian I, who agreed to mount an expedition to smuggle silkworms to the Byzantine Empire. In about 554 AD, the Eastern Roman Empire held its own silk monopoly. The first written trace of Christianity in China is barely older. A few decades later, another Nestorian missionary and his friends travelled to China, probably through the Northern Silk Road. His name was Alopen. The Nestorians had this time come to preach, bringing with them sacred texts and images. In 635, they arrived in Chang'an, the capital of the Tang Dynasty, and at the time largest city in the world. That same year, Emperor Gaozuo of Tang died. His son Taitong was a scholar and patron, and largely tolerant of all religions. He greeted the Nestorian missionaries and encouraged translation of their texts in Chinese. These were the first of the Jesus Sutras, adaptations of Christian texts in Chinese. Taizong ordered the documents be spread across the country. In 638, the Tang Emperor financed the construction of a Nestorian church in Chang'an, and 21 Nestorian priests were recognized. After his death in 649, his son Gaozong continued the policy of religious tolerance, and many more churches were built in China. Over the next couple of centuries, Christianity thrived in China, and Christian texts and images were produced. In 781, the Christian community of Chang'an erected a stele in a monastery, where they inscribed the chronicles of Nestorian movements in China, including the adventures of Elopen. It relates of a clear organization of the Church of the East with bishops and dioceses. However, as the Tang Dynasty lost more and more influence to regional military commanders called Jie Duoshi, so did Christianity in China. Repression against Christians and other religious groups started at the turn of the 8th century. Between 878 and 879, the rebel leader Huang Chao, having turned against the Tang Dynasty after his failure at the imperial examinations, led a massacre in the city of Guangzhou against foreigners. As I mentioned in my video about Judaism in China, links in the description below, members of many religions were killed, Muslims, Jews, Christians and Zoroastrians. Guangzhou was already a huge trading city, and the death toll could have been as high as 200,000. In 987, the Arab scholar Ibn al-Nadim mentions his interview in the Christian quarter of Baghdad of a monk sent to China to report on the state of Christian church there. The monk answered that Christianity was just extinct in China. The native Christians had perished in one way or another, the church which they had used had been destroyed, and there was only one Christian left in the land. A few Christian gravestones dating from later were discovered, but it was clear that the first era of Christianity in China had come to an end. A couple of centuries later, Christianity was brought back. This time, it did not come from the west, however, but from the invading Mongol Empire. After pillaging China, the Mongols installed the Yuan Dynasty, when Kublai Khan was crowned emperor in 1260. Kublai was the grandson of Temujin, more famously known as Genghis Khan. His father, Tolwai Khan, had had four sons through Sohaktani Beri, who was none other than an historian Christian. She was from the Karaite tribe, one of the several Mongol Turkic tribes who had converted to the Church of the East. After learning that there were indeed Christians in Eastern Asia, through the expansion of the Mongol Empire to Eastern Europe, 
Western Catholic missionaries started to travel the Mongol steppes to convert the Nestorians to Catholicism. Kublai Khan's personal faith leaned towards Tibetan Buddhism. However, due to the strong Christian influence in his family and the great diversity of his empire, he directed policies of religious tolerance. Meanwhile, two Westerners, Italian merchants from Venice, had left the West to avoid political instability and to look for better profit. They started traveling east. In 1266, they reached Beijing and arrived to the court of Kublai Khan. These adventurers, who were brothers, answered to the name of Niccolo and Maffeo Polo. Kublai Khan, who's supposed to be the person in the throne here, received them. Intrigued by the Western world, he wrote a letter to the Pope in Rome, asking him to send a hundred educated Christians to come and teach Western customs and Catholicism in China. He also requested oil from the Lamp of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The Polo brothers were to bring the letter to its recipient. The Yuan Emperor also sent an ambassador to Rome, who however abandoned his mission halfway back to Europe, leaving the Polo brothers alone. On their way back to Italy, they passed through Jerusalem, at the time controlled by the Crusaders, to fetch some oil from the lamp. In 1271, the newly elected Pope Gregory X received the letter brought by the Polos, and sent two friars and several gifts back to Kublai. Niccolo and Maffeo Polo, entrusted with the mission, were this time accompanied by the 17-year-old son and nephew, a young man named Marco Polo. The two friars turned away during the journey due to fear, and the Polos arrived at Beijing in 1274. Marco deeply impressed Kublai Khan, who took him in his service. They spent another 17 years in China before heading back to Venice. The Pope Nicholas IV commissioned in 1289 John of Montecorvino to preach Christianity in the East. He reached Beijing in 1294 and rapidly expanded the Western religion by translating the New Testament and other texts into Chinese, as well as building churches. Clashes between Catholicism and the Nestorian Church started to rise, as both churches had a different approach to Christianity. Franciscans from Europe, however, continuously arrived in China to reinforce John's work. Nestorianism declined rapidly, replaced by Catholicism. In less than five years, John converted more than 6,000 people. In 1308, he was consecrated Archbishop of Beijing, the first of many. The thriving of the religion would however come to an end. The outburst of the Black Death in Europe stopped Franciscans from leaving to join missions in China. Furthermore, a revolution was about to take place as the Mongol Yuan dynasty started to crumble. Zhu Yuanzhang, a Han ethnic Chinese peasant, rose in ranks after joining the Red Turban Rebellion. In 1368, he captured Beijing, ending the Yuan dynasty. He was crowned as the Hongwu Emperor, first of the Ming dynasty. The Ming was profoundly anti-foreign. While it promoted Buddhism and folk religion, Christianity, both Nestorian and Catholic, was declared illegal. By 1369, all Christians were expelled from China. The second era of Christianity in China had ended. Although the Nestorian Church would never again appear in those lands, a Catholic Church, and more generally Europe, had not yet said its last words. Thank you for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave them in the comment section below. Part 2 will be linked in the description.